Um, no, I've got another one. Brother James, thank you. Ah. I love you as a brother. Uh, amen. I'm glad I got to know you down here already. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So good. Music team, thank you. Thank you for picking one of my favorite songs, The Goodness of God. All my life, you have been faithful. That's the nice thing about getting older. You can always add more things to God's faithfulness. You see the title already, Course Correction, Psalm 16, the entire chapter. We're going to take our Bibles. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. I'll read the entire psalm and you can follow. Keep me safe, O God. For I have come to you for refuge. I said to the Lord, you are my master. Every good thing I have comes from you. The godly people in the land are my true heroes. I take pleasure in them. Troubles multiply for those who chase after other gods. I will not take part in their sacrifices of blood or even speak the names of their gods. Lord, you alone are my inheritance, my cup of blessing. You guard all that is mine. The land you have given me is a pleasant land. What a wonderful inheritance. I will bless the Lord who guides me. Even at night my heart instructs me. I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and I rejoice. My body rests in safety, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You will show me the way of life granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. Before we get into that text, I just want to talk about two concepts that I'll be using this morning in the message. Firstly, what I call onion or jawbreaker theology. Now, this is my own personal feeling here. You don't have to look for Dr. Google and see what he says on it. Uh, I haven't published it, but I think there is something about onion theology. Simply put, there is a statement or there is a story that happens. It has its significance, it has its value right in the moment. It stands. It stands unchanged in meaning. However, a new situation comes. And it adds, takes the original and it adds some meaning to it. Some new significance. You can think of this new uh, incident, story, as a layer of onion. A ring, an onion ring, that adds on to that one. And you can keep on growing and growing and you can get pretty big onions. Well, not that big. (laughs) Now you say, well, I don't like onions. My eyes water, I tear up. Please don't talk about onions. So you can take a jawbreaker. Do they still have them here? Yeah? Okay. Well, I remember as a kid, you take a jawbreaker and you put it in your mouth. And I won't ask for a show of hands, but I take it out of the mouth and I look and it has changed color. Okay? It's a new layer. It's a new significance. But inside there is the core. The second concept is course correction. There are literally hundreds and thousands of examples of core correction, course correction. I'm just going to take a couple from time. So this goes way back in time. I would have a wristwatch. 
And it wouldn't tell the time perfectly, but I knew that at noon, if I turn on CBC radio, I would get a signal. And I could set my watch, and it would be right for at least that one second. <laughs> for those of you who have traveled in Switzerland, you may have noticed the clocks at the platforms. The second hand moves slowly and consistently, and then it stops at 58 and a half seconds. And it just stays there and then jumps to the 60 seconds. Why? Well, the Swiss, they like to be punctual. They like their clocks to be set exactly right. And so they are all connected and they stop the clocks and they reset them. Now, that might be something that what I hear, the trains are not quite so punctual in Canada. Uh, maybe we could just introduce new clocks. <laughs> the Germans had a different answer to it. They made the Funk Uhr. Funk is my name, okay? Funk in German is Funk, okay? A Funk Uhr is actually a radio clock, not a clock radio, okay? It is a radio clock. So, from Germany and central Germany, Frankfurt, Mannheim, somewhere there, there's a signal that is sent out. And every clock and watch that has the funk or the radio capabilities resets. It corrects its course. Course correction. It's important when we stick with time you may say, well, there's 86,400 seconds in a day. 24 hours, 60 minutes, in an hour, 60 seconds in one day. Well, not quite. It's 0 .002 seconds longer, actually. Some days. Some days even a bit more. And so there's an extra second. And so that's why the Germans had the Funk Uhr, so that on June the 30th or December 31st, whatever, you can add the one second that was needed. Just this last Christmas, the James Watt telescope was launched, launched on Christmas Day. They started it and they intentionally didn't give it full power. And then they fired some booster rockets, and they changed the course or the direction. And they did that a number of times to where it is now in space. And soon we'll have beautiful pictures from outer space. Now, why is course correction needed? Last week, James spoke about follow me. Okay, you just get up and you follow Jesus. And it's a straight line. Just no turning back, you just go. Well, we're going to be reading in the book of Mark. And the disciples, the ones who got up and followed Jesus, we're going to hear their stories. Tim Geddard, a New Testament theologian, says it something like this. This is not his exact words, but sort of this is how I understood him. Wherever the disciples appear in the book of Mark, they muck things up. They're clumsy or they simply don't get it. They need course correction. Jesus meets with his disciples who are following him. He says, well, Good try, boys. We'll try it again. And uh, next time, let's do it like this. You see, we may think that we know the direction. But none of us are accurate enough right at the beginning to get it to go the whole way. 
And so you may say, well, I'm just going to stay here until I get turned around, and then I'll start going. But it's pretty hard to meet your destination or to steer a sitting object. Once you're moving, you can go. We need course direction because circumstance, circumstances change along the way. Turbulences while flying, icebergs if you're sailing a ship. The Titanic is a classic example of a ship that failed to change course. To err is human, thus one needs to recognize the mistake, correct the course that is on. Simply put, things happen in life and we need to course correct. Now let's look at Psalm 16. We'll look at different layers. The first layer, or the David layer. David is no longer with us. I would love to have him here today and say, David, what was going on in your life? What was happening? Like, why did you write this? Like, it's a beautiful poem. It was a beautiful song or miktal that you wrote. But it's got a story behind it. David, would you mind sharing your story? We don't have that story. But we have how he processed it. David presses the pause button on life and reflects. Keep me safe, O God, for I have come to you for refuge. David says, it's a wild world out there. There's things going on that just confuse me, that trouble me. I feel unsafe. And so, God, I come to you. Keep me safe. You are my master. Every good thing I have comes from you. He recognizes God as his master, as his Lord. He recognizes that the good things that he has, they are not his doing, they are God's doing. They come from God. He considers the people in his life. There are godly people. And he says, those are my heroes. These people are my role models. And on the other hand, there are other kinds of people. People that chase after other gods. And they're dead serious about it. They are so serious about what they believe that they are willing to give their utmost everything. They are willing to offer blood sacrifice. And in those days, they offered their children. They are willing to give their life for their ideology, for their gods. David says, I'm not even ready to talk about them. But they're there. Then he comes to the core. Verses 5 and 6. And I want to read this from two different translations. First of all, from the New Living uh, Translation. Lord, you alone are my inheritance, my cup of blessing. You guard all that is mine. The land that you have given me is a pleasant land. What a wonderful inheritance. 
New International Version. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely, I have a delightful inheritance. David says, God, you are my inheritance. The gift that I have for life. Now, in this story that David is talking about on inheritance, there's a previous story or stories. One of the first stories about inheritance is God speaking with Abraham. And where God comes to Abraham and says, I have made you a father of many nations, and kings will come from you. The whole land of Canaan where you are now an alien, I will give them as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. God promises things to Abraham. Abraham looks back at God and says, you know, God, thank you. Like, man, like this is a fantastic gift that you're giving me. But you know, I don't have any children to pass it on to. So what good is this? Like you can give me all of the land that you want, but it's empty. It's totally empty promises. And Abraham experienced God's faithfulness. And Abraham realized that God himself was the biggest gift was his inheritance. Inheritance is a gift, a blessing and a trust given to one for good stewardship. It comes out of relationship, a gift of love. There's other examples that David probably looked back on. Genesis 25 and 27. Jacob. He thought, wow, inheritance is something. You know, it's, I gotta have it. I gotta have it. You know, inheritance, it's, it's number one. Esau, you sell me your birthright, you give it to me. Isaac, his dad, he deceived him, he tricked him because he wanted this inheritance. It's gotta be something good. Let me tell you, also from the story of the prodigal son, when inheritance becomes a right, something is wrong. Inheritance is a gift. A gift that flows out of love and relationship. And then it is valued. David will have also no doubt thought about his forefathers coming out of Egypt. And Moses said, you're going to come into a new land. We're going to divide up the land so that it's fair and just and how we're all going to divide it up. And then uh, Moses said, "Uh, but one thing, descendants of Levi, the Levites will not receive an allotment of land. Their role as priest of the Lord is their allotment. Joshua 18, or, no, Numbers 26. Then Joshua actually divided up the land, and where he said in Joshua 18, 7, the Levites, however, will not receive an allotment of the land, their role as priest of the Lord is their allotment. And they were, the priests were scattered throughout the whole land. They received towns, and around the towns there was pasture land for their flocks. And it says, your ministry and your homes and the land around it, that is your inheritance. 
It appears that David claims his relationship to God. That which he has in living with God. He says, that is far more valuable to me than a clergy allowance or a land title. You, God, are my inheritance. My boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. David is exceedingly delighted for his good fortune. And he breaks out in exuberant praise, verses 7 to 11. There is no fear of death. He says, God is not going to abandon me in Sheol, in the place of the dead. No, God's not going to forget about me. I may die, but I'm going to come back to life. God will take care of me. And he is totally infatuated, convinced to the core that God is with him. So that is the David layer. Now I said there's going to be other layers. So we come to the New Testament and we have the, what I call the Jesus layer. Peter preaches in Acts chapter 2. He quotes from Psalm 16 verses 8 to 11 in verses 25 to 28. And then he gives an explanation. He says, In verse 29, this is how he explains what David is writing. Dear brothers, think about this. You can be sure that the patriarch David wasn't referring to himself, for he died and was buried, and his tomb is still here among us. But he was a prophet, and he knew God, and he God had promised with an oath that one of David's own descendants would sit on the throne. David was looking into the future and speaking of the Messiah's resurrection. He was saying that God would not leave him among the dead or allow his body to rot in the grave. God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this. Paul also quotes from this in chapter 13. So basically, um, Peter is saying here, you know, Paul wrote, or, or David wrote, and he was convinced of what he wrote, but he wasn't really referring to himself. He was referring to Jesus. Well, I'm not going to argue today. I don't know whether David really knew the words that I am penning here are about a future Messiah. But in the layer that God uses words that are significant and important and have new meaning in a new situation. And Peter grasps onto that and he says, wow, Look at the value that is added to these words. To me, it is just amazing the inspiration of Scripture, how God speaks. Other layers. We have the daily bread in our home. We use the online version because there's an extra explanation also. And uh, so we have more discussion. Hazel and I read together. Okay, that's our practice, and I would say it's probably the practice of many people here in West Portal. The Church of England has a common book of prayer. It's a book with daily readings for the morning and for the evening. Scripture. On the third morning of every month, they read Psalm 16. It is a course correction for them. Georg Handel, or George Handel, I think you say in English, wrote Messiah. 
And there's a solo part that comes towards the end in the last half that comes from this text. Chapter 16, verse 10. Another layer. But the layers keep growing. And now I'm going to add a personal layer. The Richard layer. On my onion or jawbreaker. Just a little bit of personal background. Some of you may not know me. I grew up on a farm, have rented land, have worked on construction, studied in Bible school, university, seminary, taught high school, served cross-culturally in Europe in church planting, leadership development and member care. From a child through vacation Bible school, VBS, Sunday school, different experiences. I sensed God's hand on my life and God saying, follow me. Follow me. He didn't give me a map. This is where you're going to end up. But he says, follow me. Be covered with my dust. This sense of God placing his hand on my life has caused me, and I will also bring in my wife Hazel here, together it has caused us to make certain decisions in life. Clear, distinct life choices. And yet, in all of this, I have remained human. Very human. I have faced challenges and struggles. I have had times of discouragement, even depressive times. I have looked jealousy right in the face as I compared myself to others and their successes, their possessions. There have been times where I've been far too introspective and been down on myself, and all this takes me down a dark, dismal road. And occasions, Psalm 16 has become very personal for me. It has helped me in my course correction. Three weeks ago tomorrow, I woke up early in the morning and I thought, I've got it. I know what I'm going to be preaching on on the 20th of February. I got up, started reading in my Bible, and I thought, yes, this even happens in the book of Mark. It's scripturally rooted. I prayed, and so then I emailed Pastor Andrew and I says, Andrew, this is what I've got planned. Like, does this conflict with you and your plans, your outline for Mark? He says, well, yeah, I'll be covering that. But Richard, man, if God has put this on your heart, go for it. And I was excited. I said, this threefold confirmation, God speaking. And in the matter of I was going to say hours, probably a day or two. Several circumstances, situations, incidents, and I crashed. And I realized that which I was planning to share this morning was not a message for you, but it was a message for me. It was as though God is saying, Richard, This is your construction site. That comes from German, deine Baustelle. Okay, it's your area in your life where you need to work. And I just wanted to draw that to your attention.
and in my personal depths that I went into, I thought of Psalm 16. It became a game changer, a course correction for me again. And you may wonder, well, how in the world did this psalm help you correct your trajectory? This is what I did. First of all, let me review. Why is course correction needed? As I stated, life is not always a straight line. Things happen. There's new situations. There's hindrances. There's opportunities. We gain new insights and maturity and immaturity. It's not always sin that's the problem. But it's a realization I need to adjust if I want to reach the desired destination. So what did I do? I started with this text and I paraphrased it for myself. Keep me safe, O God, for I have come to you for my refuge. I visualized myself sitting with God safe and secure in his presence. I actually visualized myself of sitting on a hammock in God's garden. Nobody else around. And I was just there. And I started talking. I took words. You are my master. And my practice is I write it in a journal. I've got a daily journal, and I've got, yeah, just sort of like the last couple of years. There's lots written there. I process by writing so that my mind doesn't just go in circles. When I write it down, it helps me order my thoughts. And I can go back days, months, or years later, and I can see what actually happened. I reviewed where I wrote the word master or Lord. I reviewed decisions that I had made where I felt this is God directing or calling me, where I said, yes, I will follow you. And I said, thank you for these decisions. Every good thing I have comes from you. And so I started listing the good things. What has made me such a rich man? Number one was a lady sitting there, my wife Hazel. She topped the list. I says, God, thank you for leading her into my life and blessing me immensely through her. And my list continued and continued. The godly people in the land are my true heroes. Now at my age, you know, there's different segments in life. So I took the childhood, youth, young adult, single years we'll call them. And I says, who were the important people, the godly people? And how did they shape me? I wrote names and what influence they had. Then I took the early years of marriage as husband, parent, teacher. Sort of the time that we were here in West Portal from 77 to 87. And there are a number of West Portal names there. Godly people who have shaped my life. I walked through 10-year segments, three segments of our life in Austria. Who are the people? Wrote their names and what happened. And you know, I got that far and I realized something is happening. My course, my walk is already being corrected. I didn't even have to go 
looking at the ungodly. I didn't even have to look at this concept of inheritance. Or I was already, in verse 7, I was rejoicing inside. Because I was able to refocus. Application. What about you? What is your layer? I want to help you unpack. Firstly, I ask, what is your story? What are the themes, the thoughts, the conversations that have been dominant in this past week? What keeps coming up? Or if you want to look beyond that, sort of your life. What are the themes that keep coming up? That's part of your story. That's got something behind it. Identify it. Secondly, what scripture resonates with your soul? What verses in the Bible speak to you again and again? Every time you take them and you read them, you say, yes. And it helps you to refocus. You say, well, I don't have one. Like, I encourage you, take Psalm 16. And work through it. Create your own onion or jawbreaker layer. On the website, you will find discussion questions for a life group. And if you're not in a life group, take them, read them, print them, and work them through on your own. And share your responses with a trustworthy person. Thirdly, pray, seek, and answer for course correction that you need. Sincerely ask God. God, this thing keeps coming up in my life. Obviously, you want to say something. Help me. And lastly, I say become quiet. Come into a safe place and invite God to speak. Amen.